Hello everyone. Okay, I hope we're all well and happy. Uh, what we're going to look at today, today's video is basically going to be about um, what factors do Prime Ministers consider when appointing people to their cabinet and why do ministers resign. Before we do that, um, I assume we're all happy uh, about the work I set on Tuesday, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, about uh, what is the cabinet, what are cabinet committees, and then what can the main role and functions of the cabinet. No one got back to me to say they were upset or anything like that. So I'm guessing that was fairly straightforward. And I'm guessing as well you're also quite happy with the cabinet office uh, bit as well and this kind of um, this core executive where you've got these top civil servants who can support the cabinet and support cabinet ministers in making their decisions, etc, etc. Um, I assume some of you found out about having another coalition because obviously you had these two parties and what they tended to do is they had what was called the quad so most decisions of the coalition were made between the Prime Minister the Chancellor, so there you two Conservatives and then two senior Liberal Democrats it was Nick Clegg and it was Danny Alexander and these four people uh, basically made most of the decisions especially those where there was some kind of um, difference between Liberal Democrats and Conservatives. So I guess we're all quite happy with that, as no one got back to me, so that is jolly good. So what we'll look at today to begin with then is what factors might a Prime Minister consider when appointing his or her cabinet. And in your booklet you've got a nice page with a picture of Boris in the middle with that heading on the top. Normally what I would do is do a little bit of a brainstorm on this. Obviously I can't do that because I haven't got you in front of me. So I'm just going to go through the different points. I suggest you write them down. You might want to write down that. I suggest you write down the examples that I give as well. Uh, if you want to find out any more details about the people I mentioned, then feel free. I'm sure Wikipedia or something can uh, give you some ins and outs. So a prime minister does not just have a free reign when appointing his or her cabinet. He's got a con or his, he or she has got a constitutional limitation to begin with. And then the other limitations, if you like, are all kind of political. Um, so constitutionally, so I just hope another one's trying to head down. Constitutionally, all members of the cabinet and ministers and junior ministers must be a member of parliament. That can either be directly elected by the people, i.e. they're in the House of Commons, or he or she can appoint people from the House of Lords. Now, by convention, the top jobs of the government and of the cabinet come from the House of Commons. So the last prime minister to be uh, from the House of Lords was, you know, going back to Victorian times, I can't remember exactly who it was. Uh, when Douglas Home took over from Macmillan back in 1964, was it 63? It might have been 63, 63 64. Uh, he was in the House of Lords. He had to give up his peerage and become an MP uh, to take up the job of Prime Minister. Um, so they had to come from Parliament. So that's a limitation because you're limited by the talent of those in Parliament. Now, what Gordon Brown did, and you do other Prime Ministers do this as well, but I think Gordon Brown's the best example. I think he did it the most. He wanted a broader kind of government. He called it a government of all the talents. So what he did, he appointed some people to be in the House of Lords, who he then appointed to be ministers. They weren't cabinet ministers, they were kind of one step below. So, for example, um, Alan Sugar was made Lord Alan Sugar, and then he was given a job in the government, um, I think it was some kind of business um, ministerial position. Um, Digby Jones, who was not a Labour Party person, um, he was in charge of the CBI, the Confederation of British, in British Industry. He was made Lord Digby Jones and he was given um, a ministerial job as well to do with business. There was another person as well who was um, some kind of medical doctor, whose name I can't remember. He became, he was ennobled and became a health minister. Um, now, all Prime Ministers do this to some extent, but I think God and Man did it the most. and did it the most kind of obviously as well. So he made these three people into... Um, he wanted them to be his government, so he made them into lords and then appointed them straight away into his government. Uh, you've got to be a little bit careful, Prime Minister, doing that because you don't want too many people from the House of Lords to be in your government uh, because it can, um, you know, issues of accountability there, aren't there? Right, all the other factors a Prime Minister's got to consider are all pure politics. So, they're in no particular order, these. These are just um, 
factors and some of these differ a little bit from prime minister to prime minister so the first thing he's got to do um or she's got to do is to balance their party factions so every political party as we know have got some people who are in one faction some that are in another so the conservatives traditionally have been divided haven't they over your more kind of um anti-european kind of people and your more pro-european type of people so like john major in the 1990s in his cabinet he appointed some pro-europeans like himself like his chancellor kenneth clark and he also appointed to balance the anti-europeans in his party he appointed people like michael portillo and uh, to be his defense secretary a more recent example of this a most obvious example is theresa may her cabinet uh, was split between leavers and remainers and she was quite keen to get some of those top levers into her cabinet and it's partly to shut them up okay um and also it means that that group of mps backbenchers are on the remain side or leave side feel that they're being represented so theresa may for example in terms of those who wanted to leave the european union she appointed uh, Boris Johnson as foreign secretary he was seen as being the leader wasn't he of the leave campaign Michael Gove as well um, he was in her cabinet I can't remember what position it was at the top of my head on the remain side um, her chancellor Philip Hammond was a remainer okay so she was trying to balance out her cabinet between uh, remainers and leavers um, it's not just conservative premises that do this others do as well so for example um someone like tony blair for example uh, in his cabinet he appointed people who supported his ideas the so-called blairites but he also promoted those who supported um, his rival if you like gordon brown obviously he became chancellor uh, but also there were other mps who were seen as being more kind of in the brown camp um, people like um, nick brown who eventually became chief whip um, he also put into his cabinet a couple of more left-wing people as well uh, to again appease those on the more left of the Labour Party so you appointed like Michael Meacher for example to be environment secretary currently for Boris um because I suppose because Europe's kind of been settled hasn't it largely and uh, because that election in 2019 got rid of most of the remainers of the Conservative Party he hasn't had to balance his cabinet in the same way um I'm not too aware at the moment exactly what factions there are in the Conservative they, they kind of died down now that Europe's kind of become less of an issue so in some ways he's had to do a bit less of this kind of balancing his factions okay so that's one thing they've got to consider um other facts they need to consider um, I've called them the big beasts. Uh, sometimes in a um, party in Parliament, there are some um, influential figures who might not be the leader. Um, I will very much put Gordon Brown under this category, under Tony Blair. He, he was an important figure in that new Labour government. He became the Chancellor. But he also had a lot of people, a lot of backbenchers who supported Brown. They thought he was a little bit more left-wing than uh, Tony Blair, a bit more Labour than Tony Blair. And as time went on and as Blair became a little bit weaker, Gordon Brown, if you like, became a natural source of kind of people who were a bit disgruntled with Tony Blair um, and Gordon Brown made quite an effort to make sure they had him on his side as a consequence Gordon Brown if you like became almost unsackable for Tony Blair he couldn't sack him because if he did he knew that Gordon Brown and all his little friends on the back benches would then cause massive problems um, so there are some of these big beasts um, you might argue for Boris Johnson as well. You might say uh, Michael Gove is possibly quite a big beast as well. I um, think if he was out of office, you know, wasn't in the cabinet, he could cause problems as well. Um, he's seen as being a counterforce to some extent. Um, famously, there's a famous quote. The um, and it, this these big beasts. It kind of fits into this view that sometimes you want to put your rivals into the cabinet, or some of your potential enemies. And the reason to do that is when you join the government, there's a, a theory called, well, there's a convention called collective responsibility. What that means is, is that in private, you can disagree and have arguments, but in public, you've got to agree what the prime minister's decided or you've got to resign from the government. And the idea of that is that everyone therefore has kind of says the same message. It avoids confusion. Now, it was Lyndon Johnson, the US president of the 1960s, who 
in a typical Lyndon Johnson type of thing, he said it's better to have these people inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. In other words, you put your enemies close to you, you put them into the cabinet, and that kind of stifles them from kind of criticising you too much in public. I think this is why Theresa May put Boris Johnson into her cabinet. It kind of stifled him, it limited his opposition, you could have made to Theresa May, and it also meant, um, again, he was, she was putting one of these big beasts in, wasn't she? If Boris Johnson had been outside the cabinet, he'd have caused all sorts of problems for Theresa May on those back benches. Now, in practice, that didn't really work, did it? But that's what she was trying to do. So that's a factor. Uh, other factors is that you might want to put people with experience into your cabinet, especially if your party's been out of office for a while. Uh, you might not have many people in the shadow cabinet who've actually been ministers before. So you think back to Tony Blair in 1997, where the last Labour government was in 1979, 18 years. There were not many people around in Parliament who from the Labour side, who'd been in government in 1917 and were still around in 1997. Therefore, he had to try and find some of these people to put them into um, his government. And again, Michael Meacher, who I mentioned before, he had been a junior minister in the Callaghan government of 1979 and he became environment secretary in 1997. And again, it's just that experience. Um, another more recent example is David Cameron in 2010. Obviously, the Conservatives have been out of power for 13 years. Um, he appointed Kenneth Clark to be in his cabinet. He became Justice Minister, I think, yeah. Now, Kenneth Clark has a huge political experience. He'd been Education Minister under Mrs Thatcher. He'd been Chancellor of the Exchequer under John Major. Um, obviously, then the Conservatives are out of power for 13 years, and so... David Caron was quite keen for Ken Clark to have a ministerial job because he could then ask him things, you know, well, you know, you've been in government and I haven't in the past. How does this work? How does that work? So you often want to have people with some experience into your, into your government, especially being out of government for quite a long time. Should Keir um, Starmer win the election in 2024, 2025, he might want to try and put one or two people into his cabinet who have been in government before. It's interesting, isn't it, just from his shadow cabinet, how he's put Ed Miliband, for example, in his in his shadow cabinet. He obviously had been a minister um, under the Brown and Blair governments. So experience is important. Um, you might also want to put people with, le with less experience in. You might want to try and promote young talent into your cabinet, uh, rising stars, if you like. Again, you put them into your cabinet, or into the junior ministers and then they work their way up, it gives them experience, they can therefore use and develop their talent. And sometimes a prime minister might almost want to, I want to use the word groom, that's not the right word, but they might want to try and um, appoint people up who they might see as future successors, you know, people who might share some of their ideas. So in the current government under Boris, um, I suspect the Chancellor, uh, Rushni Sunak, he might be an example of this. He has he's obviously had a junior job, didn't he, before underneath um, the previous Chancellor. I suspect Boris Johnson is obviously a talented person. He spoke at quite a few of the debates during the uh, 2019 election. I suspect under ordinary circumstances, Boris would probably have kept him in that job, see how he grew and developed, and then perhaps promoted him more slowly to a higher job of the next few years. But when the old Chancellor resigned, he got straight into that Chancellor's job, didn't he? So he's clearly promoted talent, hasn't he there? Someone who's quite young, who's quite talented, um, into his cabinet. Uh, and other Prime Ministers try to do this as well, try and promote the next generation into their cabinet. Um, another factor, which is kind of linked to this, is that sometimes you want balance. What I mean by that is not just political balance, i.e. Remainers and Leavers or Brownites and Blairites or left-wing and right-wing people into your cabinet, but things like ethnicity and gender. So, again, uh, there's been some criticism, hasn't there, of, of uh, Boris Johnson having a bit too much kind of white and male. But he has got some, some women and ethnic minorities into his cabinet. So, for example, Rushni Sunak as the Chancellor, um, A is young, Secondly, he's from an ethnic minority, so it kind of ticks two boxes, doesn't it? Uh, Priti Patel, ethnic minority and woman as Home Secretary. Uh, so trying to get this balance of uh, women and ethnic minorities 
young and old into your cabinet is also important. You don't want your cabinet to be described as being old, male and stale, essentially. Uh, David Cameron had this bit of a problem, actually, um, in his coalition government. And then just before the general election, I think it was in 2014, the year before the general election, he had a big reshuffle. This is where basically the Prime Minister gets rid of people and puts new people in. And he made sure he put lots of new women into um, his cabinet for that last six months before the general election. Okay, and then finally, and this has only really happened once in recent times, is that if it's a coalition government, a prime minister might be limited by the other party. So, for example, when David Cameron set up the coalition with Nick Clegg, he said to Nick Clegg, um, you're going to be my deputy prime minister, and these particular jobs, I want them to be filled by Liberal Democrats. And then it was Nick Clegg's job to you know, appoint the Liberal Democrats into those jobs. So things like his business minister was a Liberal Democrat. Um, Nick Clegg appointed Vince Cable. Obviously, he himself was Deputy Prime Minister. So, again, that limits a Prime Minister if it's a coalition. Now, in an essay, obviously, that's quite rare, isn't it? I mean, there's only one before then, going back into the Second World War. But it, it was obviously um, a limitation. So there are some of the factors a PM might consider when appointing a coach. It's quite a tricky job. And what Prime Minister will do from time to time is that they'll have a reshuffle. Now, a reshuffle is when they sack ministers and put new ones in. Sometimes it's forced upon them, like a couple of ministers have had to resign for various reasons, and a Prime Minister is forced to kind of appoint people and change people around. Or he might decide to do it just because um, he wants to freshen up his team, keep them on their toes a little bit sometimes, you know. If ministers know there's a reshuffle along the lines, um, they might make them a bit sharper and make sure they show off to the Prime Minister about how much they know, or they might make sure that their performance in the House of Commons are a bit better than normal, that type of stuff. Um, Tony Blair used to do a reshuffle once a year, um, which I think it came to a bit too much. Uh, there's no... I mean, there's some. Some jobs changed hands every year, so there was no kind of continuity. Um, David Cameron less so. One problem with reshuffles is they nearly always go wrong somehow. There's all these best laid plans and there's lots of strategic stuff done with the premise, trying to work out who's going to go where, does that fit the balanced gender mix. Um, but there's always they always tend to go wrong. There's always someone who won't who refuses to be removed or sees a certain job change being a demotion, therefore resigns, which then upsets everything. So they end up going wrong very often. But anyway, so if you see the word of cabinet reshuffle, that's what it means. So um, that's the factors. Now, what we're going to look at mainly is why did ministers resign? Um, now, there's two um, conventions which you must know about. One is called collective responsibility and one is called individual ministerial responsibility. And in your booklet, it tells you what pages to look at for each of these um convention so what i'd like to do first of all is to do your bit of reading and answer these questions essentially collective responsibility which i mentioned before is that when you join the government you've got to agree in public to what's been decided by the cabinet now a minister might disagree at a cabinet meeting and say i don't agree with this prime minister blah 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 okay they've then got to decide do they disagree so fundamentally that they cannot in public say they agree with it and therefore they are forced to resign or is it something which they think well i don't really agree with that but you know um it's not a resigning issue i quite like my ministerial car i quite like you know my ministerial job um i'll just keep my gob shut essentially so collective responsibility is quite a rare issue for ministers to resign over this it doesn't happen a great deal most ministers are quite keen on looking at the next job and stuff and they might think well you know the prime minister's been in for a while he's, he's bound to resign at some point so i'll just keep me trap shut on this and i can sound quite convincing on news night if i'm asked about it um so you've got collective responsibility and then you've got individual ministerial responsibility what this means is every minister signs up to something called the ministerial code it's kind of a code of conduct um if a minister breaks the ministerial code, like, I don't know, they've been having sex with their secretary over the photocopy machine and the secretary isn't a minister, then isn't um, their wife, sorry, then that could be a resigning effect. It could be some uh, financial kind of problem. Uh, so they're responsible for themselves, if you like, 
They're also responsible for their government department as well. So if things go seriously wrong in their department, they are responsible for it. So there have been some cases in the past of like civil servants who've lost data that they kept like they might have a memory stick with like with some sensitive data on, for example, and then left it on the train. Um it's been less of an issue of like we have cloud and stuff, don't we? But it, it had been an issue in the recent past. Um uh, is that an issue for a minister to resign over? Because obviously they weren't on the train with the civil servant. They might not have known the civil servant was taking sensitive data home. Um, should they resign over that? So there are these grey areas. Um and of course the press like all this, don't they? They'll they'll highlight all these things. Sometimes you get ministers who have a whole catalogue of like failures, if you like yet they don't actually go. Uh, Chris Grayling was a good example under Theresa May. Um, the press used to always go on about him, about the mistakes he made, poor decisions being made, etc, etc, etc. Theresa May never got rid of him, partly because I think she knew she couldn't, because, you know, she got rid of quite a lot of other ministers. Um, and he was also a bit of a useful fall guy, I think, as well. But you do have this individual ministerial responsibility. Now, what I'd then like to do, and you need to use uh, Wikipedia for this, I would suggest, I've put on a number of ministers from a number of governments, and what you need to do is to find out the circumstances for their resignation and decide, was that circumstance catch responsibility? Was that individual ministerial responsibility? Some of them involve sex, okay? Some of them a bit less kind of juicy, so to speak. So I'd like to do that. On teams, I've put on uh, Gavin, I've not, I've not put him on this table, Gavin Williamson is now the Education Secretary, but under Theresa May, he was the Defence Secretary. He had to resign over some leaks that had taken place. Um, on teams, I've actually put on um, a link to, to uh, I think it was some, like, I think one's Channel 4 News and one's BBC News, um, just describing his resignation. So if you're interested, have a look at that as well. Uh, gives you a more recent example. And of course, you had the Chancellor resigned into this year under Boris Johnson. Um, and it seems to be about over, he was upset about Boris Johnson wanting to control, have too much control over the, his department or something. So again, you might want to look into that. Okay, and then finally, thank God you might be thinking, um, I found this graph which is underneath that table about the number of resignations which governments receive. But you need to think about if too many ministers go, that can be quite destabilising, can't it? So prime ministers are reluctant very often for too many ministers to resign because it makes them appear kind of not in control of events. Um, if you look at this graph at the bottom, along the bottom is the length of time in office and upward are the number of resignations. So if you have a look, Mrs Thatcher, she was in the longest, wasn't she, just under 12 years. OK, and over that 12 years, she eventually got to 25 ministers resigning over 12, well, 11 and a half years. I don't know what 25 divided by 11 and a half is or whatever it will be. That would then give you an average one per year. You'll notice that that most of them came in the second half. Tony Blair, as well, just under Mrs Thatcher, 10 years. He got about 29, I think, that graph can show, ministers resigning. But Theresa May, she got to 25, the same as Mrs Thatcher got, but she got there in just over two years. Which shows them that Theresa May had lots and lots and lots of resignations from her government in quite a short period of time. Which would suggest, wouldn't it, that her government was less stable than Mrs Thatcher's. So it's quite a nice graph to show that. So what patterns do, of does this graph show you, okay? Because you'll also notice that Gordon Brown had quite a few as well under a short period of time. And John Major had quite a few as well, much higher than Blair and Thatcher. Major, Brown and... Uh, Major, Brown and May, uh, you could say they both had divided parties. May and Major had quite small majorities and the divisions are over Europe. So... There are some similarities here. And again, if you're doing an essay about prime ministers, you can mention um, something on this possibly. And the final bullet point is to find out uh, the resignation of which minister led to Mrs Thatcher's kind of final downfall and why. So if you do all that for me, there's not actually a huge amount there really. If you do all that for me for Monday or Tuesday next week, and I'll get the next video up there, I'm going to look at relations between the prime minister and the cabinet. Okay, any problems, um, let me know.